Awesome, thank you for that. Let me get my screen going. All right. All right, hopefully that looks okay. And I'll introduce myself. My name is Dr. Hannah Levinson. I am a postdoctoral research scholar at North Carolina State University. And currently I am a part of the uh, Specialty Crops Integrated Pest and Pollinator Management Lab. So I mostly look at bees in agricultural areas and how we can grow our crops while also protecting these important organisms. And part of that means that there's a lot I need to know about how bees live, how they work, and I found that this information is kind of hard to get sometimes and hard for people to access. So I love sharing as much as I can. Uh, we don't need to all learn it from scratch every single time. So hopefully this is helpful and you walk away learning something that you can share with others and we can keep spreading all this information. There's a couple places within here that I've um, paused for questions, but again, feel free to throw in the chat anytime you have a question and um, I'll get to it at uh, those points in the lecture. So today we'll talk about the who, the what, and the how of native bees. If I can get my screen going. Okay, so we'll talk about who, even though they're not people, I, I still refer to it that way. Who are the different kinds of bees that we have in North Carolina? And we'll talk a little bit about native bees in general around the world. We'll talk about what's happening to bees right now. Then we'll talk about what we are already doing to support them and work that's currently happening in North Carolina and abroad. And then also how you can help them yourselves in your own yards and gardens. So we'll jump in talking about different kinds of bees. So bees are one of the most diverse groups of organisms. They're extremely diverse from this picture. You can just see they come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and they all live differently from each other. They all provide different pollination services, um, which can make them very hard to learn about and work with, but also really exciting. So to give you an idea of how diverse bees are, in North Carolina alone, we have more than 560 different species that exist in our state. Um, and there's a chance that more will be discovered or more will come and go as our um, habitats change. In North America, we have more than 4,000 different species. And then in the entire world, there are more than 20,000 different species of bees. So when I talk about this, I like to encourage all of us as we learn to be more specific when we talk about bees. Um, I have also been guilty of this, so I'm trying to be better, but a lot of times when people say the word bee, they use it as almost a shortcut to refer to honeybees specifically. But the word bee refers to all of these species, all 20,000 we have in the world. Um, and since they are very different from each other, um, I like to encourage everyone to be more specific. So when you mean honeybee, say honeybee or bumblebee or sweat bee, I could go on and on and on and we'll start learning about those names um, throughout the presentation today. So I mentioned bees can be very different from each other. That's why knowing their identity is really important. Um, when you know the species of bee you're looking at or talking about, you then know what they need, how we can help them. And the ways that bees are different are their size, where they live, how they live, what they eat, and how they collect their food. And we'll break all of these down one by one. So, so starting with their size, bees are very diverse in size. We have a big size range on the screen right here. So the smallest bee in the world is Perdita minima here. It is 0 0.08 inches. You can see it next to a coin. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have the largest bee in the world, which is Megachile Pluto, that measures at 2.5 inches. Um, and neither of these bees are here. Perdita minima is a desert species, and Megachile Pluto is in Asia. Um, but we have uh, bee species anywhere in between those two extremes. This is what those two look like next to each other measured up. And uh, I like to point out that when bees emerge as adults, they are fully grown. So this bee is not small because it needs to grow. That's just how big that bee species is. Um, so anywhere in between, you can find a bee that's um, a size smaller, bigger, anywhere in between that. So they're also diverse in where they live. There are four broad categories of nesting materials that bees utilize. First, we have soil nesters. So they will literally dig into the ground and build their nests. Many times we walk over their nests without even knowing. 
Uh, bees can nest in wood that includes sound solid wood, but also rotting wood. Bees nest in st inside stems and twigs, and then also in cavities. So even though they're using all these different materials, just to add another layer, they also can build their nests in different ways within these materials. So they can be builders, meaning they build a nest from scratch, uh, brand new. They can be renters, which um, we mean by that, that they use previously existing structures, previously, previously existing cavities, or they build upon previously existing structures. Or they may not even build their own nests and they might be parasites. So some species of bees are considered parasitic. Uh, they may sneak into the nest of another species nest. Uh, for example, they might sneak down this tunnel, go lay an egg, and then the host bee would then collect resources and feed the parasitic bee's egg instead of its own egg without knowing it. So they're kind of sneaky. And to give you an idea of the breakdown of all of the 20,000 species that we're talking about of bees, 70% of them live in the soil and 50% of them are building their own nests from scratch. So most of the bees in the world are living underground. We probably don't even notice them. The other thing I want to point out is over here on the right hand side cavity nesters. This is probably what we're used to hearing, learning, talking about. This includes honeybees and bumblebees. And I'd like to point out that that constitutes less than 1% of all the bee species in the world. So the bee species we know the most about, we're most used to talking about, are actually very unique and very different from the majority of bee species that also need attention, and also need protection. So I want to show you some examples of what these nests might look like in real life. Um, I mean, some are images, some are drawings, but so a female bee that nests in the soil will usually dig straight down. It could be a couple inches up to a couple feet. She'll then build tunnels off of that main tunnel that ends in a cell. And in that cell, she will put food, which is pollen and nectar, lay an egg. This The egg will then develop into a larva, then a pupa, then emerge as an adult. And here's an image of a real bee with her real um, food resource and egg that she laid. Next, we have wood nesters. The best example we have are carpenter bees, which people love to hate and hate to love, but they are pollinators. Um, and if you've ever wondered what is going on inside that wood when they're building their nests, this is an image of a nest that we cracked open on NC State's campus, uh, carpenter bees always nest in the wooden bus benches on NC State. Um, and this is what the nests look like inside those pieces of wood. So they have individual cells, just like we saw with those soil nesters where the, the female mother bee puts a food resource, lays an egg, it develops into a larva, then a pupa. But instead of being in separate cells, these are set up in a linear fashion um, since she has to burrow through the wood and build the tunnel that way. Next, we have stem nesters. You'll notice right away, it looks very similar to those wood nesters where they're in a, a, a linear fashion, a line down the tunnel of the stem. Bees that nest this way are leafcutter bees and mason bees. These are also the bees that you will be supporting if you put up a bee hotel. Uh, and you can see an example of that here. And these kinds of bees, depending on the species, use different resources to build their nests within the tunnels. So the, here's an example of a bee that collects mud, and that's what they use to separate each egg's cell apart from each other. Some bees use resin, and then others here use leaves. And then the last category is cavity nesters. Like I mentioned, that's what we're probably used to hearing about, bumblebees and honeybees. They really are just looking for a protected area that they then build their nest within. And sometimes that means they show up in places that we don't necessarily want them to like little cavities in our houses. All right, so now we know a little bit more about where bees live. And then within these nests, bees can live differently and interact with each other differently. So we have another gradient and I'll start over on the solitary side. So within a single nest, there are solitary species, meaning a single female builds her own nest, collects her own resources, lays her own eggs, takes care of her young, and no other bee helps her do this. She does it all on her own. And many times these species don't meet the eggs that they lay as they mature into adults. Most of the time the adults are alive in the summertime 
and then their eggs develop in the winter and the adults do not make it through the winter. So it's a very solitary lifestyle. Usually they are only interacting with themselves. Our best examples here are leaf cutter bees and mason bees that go in those bee hotels. They are solitary nesters. So then as we scoot closer up to um, being more social, we have aggregating species. So these are still solitary in the sense that they are working on their own nests, doing everything themselves, but they nest in aggregations very close to each other. Um, oh, and I wanted to show that this dirt is what the female brought up as she was digging down into the soil, building those tunnels that you saw images of. And here's an example of one of those bees closer up. And then here's an example of what an aggregation might look like. Most of these species are early spring species. So if you have a sunny hill that has grassy, patchy areas like this, you might see this in early spring where you have, maybe you've seen it and thought it was an anthill, but there'll be lots of flying insects all around here. There can be hundreds and hundreds of bees in this one area. And each of these dirt mounds is a single female that dug down into the dirt, built a tunnel, brought the soil back up, and this is her individual nest that she's taking care of all on her own, but they're all nesting in the same area together because they have very specific requirements for where they can build their nests. So if you have this in your yard, I always tell people that's very special because they only nest in certain areas um, and you can't make them nest somewhere they don't. So if you have it in your yard, that's very special and I am jealous of you. Um, so going closer to social, we have communal. So this is these species, they may share a nest entrance. So they are entering through the same entrance hole, cavity, whatever. But then within the nest, the larger nest, they're building it all themselves, similar to what we've just talked about. Moving further along, we have eusocial species. Our best example are bumblebees. These um, are where bees are working together within a single nest. So they do have a division of labor. Different bees are doing different tasks. Some are collecting food, some are taking care of the eggs, some are defending the nest. They have overlapping generations. So adults are raising young that they then do meet. Um, but these nests are on an annual life cycle. So the nest and colony are all working together, all taking care of each other. At the end of the season, they will, they will produce new queens those queens will then go off, find a place to hibernate through the winter, and the rest of the colony does not survive through the winter. So then the next spring, the new queen has to go out, start a whole new colony. The whole thing happens over and over again in a cycle. And then we'll end with our highly used social species, very similar to what we just talked about, division of labor. They're all working together for cooperative brood care. There is overlapping generations. But the difference here is that they are on a perennial cycle. So they do survive the winter as a colony, even though adults are aging out and dying, the colony itself as a almost super organism um, survives over the winter and lasts for years and years and years. Of course, the best example for this is honeybees, where the colony can last for years and years and years. An individual queen can live up to five to seven years. Um, but other workers may only live a couple months, but the colony itself is persisting for many years. So again, I wanna highlight the distribution of different species. So what we're probably used to hearing about honeybees and, and bumblebees that are social, less than 5% of bee species worldwide. So less than 5% of the 20,000 bee species live this way. So again, the, the species that we know the most about and we talk the most about are actually very unique. In the rest of the bee world, more than 90% of the 20,000 species are living solitarily. They do not have queens. They do not work together. That's the individual females doing everything on her own. Um, so just want to highlight that the species we know the most about are very unique in the bee world. And the ones that we don't know a lot about is the majority of the species that we need to give attention to and protect. All right, so I cannot see the chat, so we'll see how this goes. But if there are questions, I know that was a lot at once. I like to pause there and just have people digest a little bit and if they have any questions. At this point, if you have any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself and ask uh, Hannah directly. And I'll pause for questions again at the end, so don't feel pressure to do it now. I just know that was a lot. So I'm going to assume that you are going to go into how many of these we see in North Carolina 
and how we can support them here. I will go into more detail about how we can support them at the end and what's already being done, but um, in general, in North Carolina, uh, at the very beginning, that breakdown, we have 560, more than 560 different species, and the proportions of about 70% are ground nesters, 90 plus percent are solitary. Those proportions stay pretty constant, so you can assume that about 70% of our 560 species are living in the ground and about 90% are solitary. And another dumb question, um, or at least a dumb question, maybe not my first, maybe not, maybe it'll be my first dumb question. How can you tell the difference between the ground nesters that you just showed where you said you were jealous if they were in your yard how do they look different from a fire ant um, nest? Yes, that is a great question. None of those were dumb questions. Um, so mostly I would say the best way is just observing and taking a moment to look at the dirt mounds. Um, in general, ant colonies might have smaller nest entrances because they're smaller bodies that need to go in and out. So it's easier to protect if they keep it only as big as it needs to be. Um, the other thing is if you look and see who's around, um, so those early nesters on a sunny day, there will be hundreds of bees flying only a couple inches off the ground. It's really hard to miss um, on a sunny day. It's pretty magical, I think. Um, but yeah, you'll see a lot of bees flying around. And if you take a second, you'll watch them. You'll be able to see a female find her nest, go into her nest, drop off any resources she collected and then come back out. And then for ants, um, there shouldn't be anything really flying around and you will see fire ants coming in and out or any ant really coming in and out of the nest, collecting their own kind of resources, bringing those back to the nest. So a lot of it is just taking the time and observing what you're looking at. All right, Hannah, we've got two questions in the chat and you may be answering this with um, um, the rest of your presentation. The first one is, which of our NC native bees most need conservation uh, in that initiatives? Mm -hmm. Yes, I think that I will save that question for more towards the end. Um, oh. It will not be a straightforward answer, but I will tell you what we what we know. All right, and then um, this may be also something you're going to be answering later on. Uh, what are some of your favorite ways to reach out to the public to educate them um, about not being afraid of bees? That is a great question. Um, I mean, presentations like this, uh, I do this a lot. I really enjoy talking to people. And then once people know, it's weird how often bees come up in conversation. And once you learn about bees, you start seeing them everywhere. I've, I've heard people tell me that a lot. Um, so I think once people know, they then can tell others and tell others. And a lot of times it's um, showing people that bees aren't scary. So. I have bees fly around me all the time. I have wasps and bees land on me. And if you don't freak out, other people take a second to notice that maybe it's not as scary as they might think or that that one experience they heard about or maybe experienced themselves. So a lot of it is just in whatever daily life, interacting with people and sharing fun facts and at the expense of maybe looking like a nerd, which I'm fine with. <laughs> but yeah, I think just just telling people and um, I have resources I'll share at the end if you want to learn more and then you can also share those resources with people. Um, I think with that I'll keep moving, but we'll definitely have plenty of time for questions later. All right, so we learned about where bees live, how they live. So now I wanna talk about what they eat and what they're feeding their young within those nests that we talked about. So there is another spectrum we'll talk about. On one side, we have specialist pollinators. This is the example here. So this means that certain species of bees may need a specific family, genus, or even species of flower that they need to collect resources from to be able to successfully raise healthy um, eggs, larvae, young. And many times this results in a mutualistic relationship where that flower then needs the specialist pollinator to be efficiently pollinated. So the example here is the squash bee sitting in the squash flower. So the family cucurbita is what this bee visits to collect resources. And this flower gets its best pollination when squash bees visit it. So a lot of times they form very close relationships. 
On the other side of the spectrum, we have generalist pollinators, where if there's a flower that produces nectar and pollen, most of the time a generalist pollinator could collect from that and successfully raise their young. The caveat here is that generalist pollinators then need to visit many different kinds of flowers in order to get a balanced diet and all of the nutrients they need. And of course there's anywhere in between these two extremes that you can find um, depending on the species of bee you're talking about. So here are a few examples of our specialist and generalists. So we have the squash bee we just talked about, sunflower bees, blueberry bees. So this bee is the best pollinator for blueberry flowers. Other bees may visit blueberry flowers, but they can't pollinate it as well as this blueberry bee, and this blueberry bee needs the blueberry pollen. And then we also have the alfalfa leafcutter bee. This bee was actually introduced uh, for agriculture for pollinating alfalfa and has now um, kind of naturalized and spread to other areas. So we do have many species of bees that are not native in the US. Uh, we have sweat bees that are considered generalist. Our bumblebees are generalist, carpenter bees, and honeybees, of course, are generalists. And in case you didn't know, honeybees are not native to North America. Our honeybees were brought over from Europe. Okay, so no matter what bees eat, they when you break it down, they all need two basic things. So they collect pollen and nectar from the plants and they get different nutritional content from those two food sources. So pollen is their main source of protein. They may get other things like amino acids and other little nutrients. And then nectar is their main source of carbohydrate. Again, they may get other little nutrients, but main things, pollen, protein, nectar, carbohydrate. And all bees need these two things to raise their young. So I wanna bring back this picture we saw of the ground nesting female with her egg that she laid. And this ball is actually pollen and nectar mixed together, then turned into what we call a pollen ball. And that's what she lays her egg on. So most bee species, if not all, uh, do this where they mix the pollen and nectar together and then feed it to their egg that way. A question I get a lot, so I like to bring it up here is how are, wasps, hornets, yellow jackets, bees, how are they all connected? How are they different? Um, so this is the family tree of Hymenoptera and you'll see lots of different wasps, you'll see ants, and then you'll see bees up here. So all of these um, organisms are related. They're maybe cousins to each other, if that makes sense to you to think about it that way. And then we have different um, groups of bees that uh, all group together. So they are related but the main difference between them is where they get their source of protein. So wasps are hunters and they get their source of protein from other insects and animals. So they go out, collect caterpillars. Some collect from um, dead animals they find. So that's why wasps are really great in your garden. They eat some of the pesty caterpillars and other insects you don't want going to your plants. And then like we talked about, bees get their pollen from, or their protein from pollen. So some people think about bees as vegetarian wasps. They are related, but the biggest difference is where they get their protein from. And then because of this dietary difference, they then look structurally different. So wasps are hunters. They're very sleek, aerodynamic, shiny. They don't have a lot of fur. Bees are fuzzier. They have a lot of hair. And if you look at these hairs under a microscope, you see this. Each hair has individual little branches of hair that come off. Um, since bees are collecting pollen, they need a lot of surface area, a lot of static to carry as much pollen on their body as possible. So because of these dietary differences, um, it then formed visual differences and structural differences in these insects. And then just to complicate it, of course, even though all bees need pollen and nectar, they collect it differently and bring it back to their nest differently. So um, this is actually a really good trick to start to learn to um, identify and recognize different bees because they do carry pollen on their body different places. So most of the bee species, I don't have a percentage for you here, but most of them um, carry pollen all over their hind legs. So this female here, she does have pollen on her hind legs, but they are this color and this big because of all of the hair on her hind legs. So it looks just like that microscope picture I showed you, really fuzzy, really branchy, and she'll pack this with pollen all over, carry it back to her nest. It's a little messy, but she gets a lot of pollen. 
So then we have other bees, honeybees and bumblebees, that also carry pollen on their hind legs, but they'll pack them very neat and tidy into these pollen balls, carry it on a special structure on their leg called a pollen basket or a corbicula. And this is a really, really great way to start learning to identify bees. If you see a bee that's carrying a pollen ball, it has to be a honeybee or a bumblebee. Even if you think it looks like a honeybee or bumblebee, but it's carrying pollen a different way, it cannot be a honeybee or bumblebee. So tricks to start um, recognizing what bees you're looking at. Other groups of bees carry pollen on the underside of their belly. You can see all of the yellow pollen in her light colored hair right here on her belly. These are leaf cutter bees and mason bees. So another great trick to really narrow down what you're looking at. But of course, there's always a complication and a trick and some bees don't carry pollen on their body at all. Um, the main ones are males. So only female bees are collecting resources, laying eggs, taking care of the young. The male bees do not do that. The male bees are really just around to mate with female bees. So a lot of times they look very wasp-like. Their legs are slender, they're not as hairy. Um, and most of the time, female bees and male bees of the same species look completely different from each other. And until you learn them, there's no way to know that they are the same species. Um, those parasitic bees we talked about where they sneak into the nest of other bees, lay eggs, and don't raise their young can also look very wasp-like because they are not collecting pollen for their young. They're not collecting resources, so they're not as hairy. And then the last example is actually the bee um, pictured here. This is a yellow-faced bee, a little native bee, and she carries pollen and nectar back in her stomach to her nest. So she does look very wasp-like in color, both in that she is black and yellow and doesn't have a lot of hair, but she's carrying pollen in her stomach. So just to trip you up, there's complications, of course. And so I do want to point out that just looking at color um, can trick you and is not necessarily the best way to identify what kind of insect you're looking at. I would say bees, flies, and wasps are what people um, want to know how to identify between the most. So I like to bring up a couple examples here. Uh, there's only one bee on this page. It's right here. This is a honeybee. This is a fly actually, and this is a yellow jacket. So some tips and tricks for trying to learn how to distinguish between flies, wasps, and bees is looking at specific characteristics. So the first is the wing. So flies only have two wings. You can see two big wings here. And then bees and wasps, it's hard to tell in this image, have four wings. It's actually probably easier in this one. Yeah, so you can see they have two big four wings and two hind wings. So wasps and bees have four wings, flies have two wings only. The next body part that's really good to look at is the face. So you can see how big these flies' eyes are. Flies have really, really big eyes. That's why they're so agile. Um, also, their wings are how they're agile. But then they also have very small or basically no antenna. You'll see that the wasps have more narrow eyes, more narrow faces in general, and very long elbowed antenna. And then the last um, thing is the overall body. So you'll see this fly is very round. There's not really a big distinction between different body parts. Where the wasp, we already talked about, it's very streamlined, narrow, aerodynamic, but wasps usually have this very narrow waist where it's three body parts, head, thorax, and abdomen are very distinct from each other. And then bees are fuzzier, of course, they don't have that wasp waist, but they're still they have a lot of fur, a lot of hair, really not fur, a lot of hair. And then those three body parts can be very distinct from each other. Okay, so that is just introducing you to who you can expect to see, how you can start to learn um, how bees are different, why it's important to know what bee you're looking at, what bee you're talking about. Um, so now we'll talk about what's happening to bees um, in general. So it is considered that we are now in the Earth's sixth mass extinction, which means we are losing a lot of species, we're losing a lot of biodiversity. And this is going to have pretty big impacts on all of our ecosystems. Um, it is considered to be human um, run, human man-made. And of course, in this uh, presentation, we're gonna focus on insects, but we are seeing biodiversity losses across the entire animal kingdom. So it's not specific to insects, but of course I'm gonna focus on that. And focusing even more, all insects are seeing declines, but we are going to talk about pollinators. We are seeing declines in moths and butterflies, and then of course also in bees. 
And this is definitely concerning because insects in general provide a lot of important ecosystem services. They're decomposers, they're nutrient cyclers, but pollinators of course provide pollination services, which is very important to our natural areas and also our agricultural systems, of course. Uh, you may have heard the phrase that every one third of your food you can thank a bee for. That's not quite true. It's been a little jumbled through this worldwide game of telephone of everyone sharing that fact. Um, there's still a lot of food we would get without bees. There's a lot of crops that are wind pollinated. We have corn, we have potatoes, we have wheat. A lot of our big calorie um, providers for our diet are not bee pollinated. But the concern is that a lot of the food that we get our vitamins and nutrients from, our vegetables, our fruits, those are bee pollinated. Um, so a lot of our fun foods in our diet, a lot of our nutritious foods in our diet would be a problem if we lost our bees. We would still have something to eat, but we would probably have a lot of problems. And then as far as our natural areas go, about 90% of all um, naturally occurring flowering plants need pollination and most of that is provided by bees. So think about your flowering trees, our bushes, our gardens, um, and all of that feeds into the ecosystem. So the flowering plants that then provide food for caterpillars or butterflies or produce berries and all of that then feeds birds and all of that then feeds the next organism. So it does work up the food web, um, starting with bees a lot of times. So our natural areas rely on bees and of course, uh, a lot of our important agricultural crops rely on bees. And there are four big categories of, of threats that are causing bee decline. At first, this is gonna be specific to honeybees and then I'll tell you how we can broaden it out to all bees. So the four Ps is a general term that many people in bee research use. Um, so the first one is poor nutrition. That's coming from as we develop uh, areas, as we intensify our agriculture, we continue to urbanize areas. This um, alters habitat, fragments the habitat and reduces the availability of flowers to bees. So if bees can't get flowers, they can't be healthy, they can't reproduce, but also for especially generalists, for example, if they're not getting enough variety in their diet, they may be missing important nutrients. The next P is pathogens. So just like us, bees can get sick. Uh, there are viruses that affect bees and gut parasites that affect bees. Um, and a lot of times we're concerned that different species can be passing viruses to each other. Definitely bees of the same species can pass these viruses and gut parasites to each other. Um, so it really is a, a whole community that can get sick, not just one species or the other. Uh, of course, pesticides, uh, a lot of times this comes up with bees, so I'm sure it's not a surprise that it's one of the four Ps. There's those acute effects where um, there's a spray and you can see insects dead on the ground right away. But there's a lot of chronic effects and sublethal effects that we really don't know enough about. Um, if a pesticide is sprayed nearby and a bee is exposed to it, even if it's not immediately killed by that spray, there's evidence that it could affect their brain function. It could affect how they forage. It could also affect their gut microbiome. They might not be able to digest nutrients properly. So there's still a lot we don't understand with these sublethal effects in pesticide exposures. And then the last is a specific parasite that is specific to honeybees, the Varroa mite. So this only impacts honeybees. It does not impact any of our other native wild bees. Um, but the Varroa mite is a really big deal for honeybees. So it was accidentally introduced from the Asian honeybee. And when it was first introduced into the US, about 80% of all the feral honeybee colonies in the US were wiped out. Um, so it feeds on the fat bodies of the bees. So it makes them not as able to um, survive as long, but it is also, the Varroa mite is also known to transmit viruses. So not only can it weaken bees, it can also then make them sick. So it's a really big deal. And right now our agricultural system, I would say is pretty reliant on honeybees. Um, so it is actually very important that this pest is affecting honeybees. And of course, all of these can work together to then lead to the loss of genetic variability, which would then further intensify all of these effects. So if bees aren't getting enough nutrition, they may be more susceptible to patho pathogens. Then as the populations decline, their genetics decrease, which then 
can make these even worse and worse and it turns into a cycle. So all of these do not work independently, they can work together. And then how I would broaden this out to all bees, like I said, the varroa mites only affect honeybees. So we have things like climate change we need to think about where certain plants may start to have their distributions changed as temperatures warm, which means those plants may no longer be available to bees in certain areas. Uh, we also have bees that are very temperature specific. So one bee that is of concern of North Carolina is the rusty patched bumblebee. It was listed as endangered for the continental US and it has not been found in North Carolina since I believe about 1994. Um, this is a cold weather bee, so it is going up into higher elevations as well as higher latitudes in the US. So there's a chance that it's in some isolated area in our Appalachian Mountains but mostly it's moving up further north in the continental US and North America, and we may not see it again in North Carolina since our temperatures are warming. The other thing is competition between species. So as habitat becomes less and less available, there's more bees for less uh, flowers and less nesting resources. And the bees that are more aggressive or those social species could outcompete our solitary species. So if there's enough to go around, there's enough to go around. And that's why it's really important to protect the floral resources and the nesting resources that bees need. They need both and we need to protect both. But as we have our habitat altered, competition could potentially be a problem. So I'll show you some evidence just so you know that I'm not just making up these four Ps, um, but there is research showing that parasites, pesticides, lack of flowers or poor nutrition do affect bees and that these can work together to make the impact even more pronounced. And that um, agricultural intensification, habitat development has been shown to affect pollinators and other beneficial insects. And this is happening a lot in agricultural areas as we need to feed our population. Agricultural areas will continue to be expanded. And if we combine cropland and pasture land, which are both man-made land types, it is now one of the largest biomes on our planet. So we are having very large effects on our planet that is then going to affect all of our organisms and all of our ecosystems. And it's not just agriculture, it's basically any man-made area does change the bee communities we see. Um, urban areas can be really great for some species, but rare species or specialist species are not very well supported in urban areas. And we really need our native habitat to fully support the beneficial organisms that we wanna protect. And then of course, climate change, there's lots of research going into how this is affecting our food webs. And then there is evidence that we do see competition. Um, some big focus is on honeybees and bumblebees because those are those um, social species. So bumblebees can have several hundred individuals living in one nest. Honeybees can have tens of thousands of individuals living in one nest. And so, like I said, when there's enough to go around, nesting and floral resource wise, there's enough to go around. But you can imagine if we're developing all this land and there's only a little bit of flower resources left, those hundreds of individuals in a bumblebee colony or tens of thousands of individuals in a honeybee colony can really overwhelm a single solitary female trying to build her single nest. So that's why it's also, it's not just important because bees need habitat, but also so we can support all of our bee species. That's why it's important to protect our habitats. So I'm sure that was a lot of doom and gloom, <laughs> felt very sad, but I'll talk about what we're doing to support bees and um, what we're finding and what's going on in North Carolina and abroad. So there's a lot of work going into finding habitats where we do see a lot of good bee support going on. So protected areas are many times big biodiversity hotspots. So the more land we protect, the more other organisms, of course, we're just gonna protect by default. And then we are seeing evidence that not surprising, but diverse landscapes are better for bees. And so we're getting a lot of evidence that can then be used to lead to policy changes that um, we know what we need to do to protect our bees. 
and people are actually implementing this. So there's a big push right now in agricultural areas to put back habitat, to add plantings of flowers, to add hedgerows and other natural areas. And we are seeing beneficial effects from this um, in multiple areas across the country and across the world. And that brings me to a specific project I'd like to highlight. So the North Carolina Department of Agriculture um, started an initiative in late 2015, early 2016 called Protecting NC Pollinators. And this mandates the planting of pollinator habitat on um, agriculture research stations across the state. And um, as part of my dissertation, I actually looked at this habitat and documented how um, it impacted the bee communities. I don't have time to go through it today, but I do want to just quickly share that we found that bee abundance and diversity over time was supported by the addition of this habitat into agricultural areas. However, we found that habitat quality can change over time since adding habitat into agricultural areas is a man-made structure. We can't just throw seed down and leave it. We need to really put effort into providing quality habitat to make sure that we're continuously supporting the bee communities. There is a concern that as bees are concentrated in the same area, they may share pathogens with each other. Like I mentioned, there is some evidence in some um, systems and some habitats that this is happening. Um, we looked at this in the North Carolina program that I just talked about, and we did not find evidence of this, which is really great. Um, we want to check over time that that doesn't change, but for now it seems like this planted habitat in agriculture does not spread disease. And then the last thing I'll talk about is we looked at how this habitat impacted crop yield. Since bees are pollinators, one big way to support protecting pollinators is to focus on the fact they are important for our agriculture. So we looked at soybeans and we found that adding habitat into these research stations, even though soybeans are not considered to be pollinator dependent, there was an increase in yield in soybeans and we did find bees going from the habitat and visiting soybean flowers. So that's really great, really exciting, and um, got a lot of interest, especially because many people don't consider soybeans to be pollinator dependent. Um, okay, so for sake of time, I'm skipping a few slides. Let me see, okay, so here. Um, so we do have a few questions about adding habitat. I just wanna point this out that, um, like I mentioned, we wanna make sure we're putting out really good habitat in the environment. We wanna make sure we're supporting bees the best we can. So there are some questions. Um, we still don't understand how it best to establish this habitat, as in what size it needs to be. We don't know exactly what plants are best to include. There are some really good plant lists out there, but we don't have evidence-based, this is the best plant list to exist. And I don't know if that, that will ever exist. Um, this will change depending on where you are in North Carolina, but also the world. So there's a lot of questions around that. Um, different bees will respond differently to this, especially considering the fact that they all live in different places. You know that now in the ground, the in wood and stems, all of those are very different nesting habitats. So doing one thing might not help all of those different kinds of nests. Also, there's different foragers, specialists versus generalists. They might respond differently and different levels of sociality might require different habitat characteristics. There's also a lot about bees we don't know. We don't know a lot about our native bee population still. There's still a lot to learn. And so we might um, find that our recommendations change as we learn more. And there's other aspects of the ecosystem that definitely need to be explored more. I focused on bees um, for the NCDA project, but that habitat supports butterflies, it supports grasshoppers, we found birds eating the seed, we found a cat just hanging out one time. So there's a lot of organisms that go to these um, habitats. They also help with soil retention and water quality. So there's a whole bigger suite of impacts that we didn't have a chance to look at yet. Um, and like I mentioned, all of this information does feed into um, recommendations for policymakers. Um, and I won't read this now, but um, there's a lot of bee researchers across the world working together to develop recommendations based on the research that we're all doing to hopefully lead to policy change. And one thing I do wanna highlight is um, there is a national native bee monitoring network. It's funded by the USDA 
And there is a citizen science component. I don't know too much about it because I'm just a contributing scientist. I'm not an organizer of this group. But if you want to know more what you could do, you can visit the website at the end usnativebees.com. Um, and that is a project that just started in 2020. It'll go for a few more years, and they're trying to connect as many people across the U.S. all focused on protecting bees and other pollinators together. So I'll wrap up in the last few minutes with what you can do to help. So um, like I mentioned, planting a diversity of flowers. Um, different bees need different kinds of flowers. Different flowers provide different nutritional content. So providing as many different kinds of flowers as possible is really important. Um, any habitat is better than no habitat. If you can only plant one flower, that's better than just having a, a bare patch of soil or cement or mulch. But if you can have multiple flowers, the more flowers you can add, the more different species you could support. Uh, now you know we need to provide a diversity of nesting sites and materials. So we can't pave over everything. We can't put mulch everywhere in our gardens. There's a lot of bees that need bare ground. There's also bees that need stem nesting um, areas. But um, even if we put bee hotels, that won't support the ground nesters. It won't support the wood nesters or the cavity nesters. So we really need a diversity of nesting sites. One thing that could be good for bees, but other organisms as well, is leaving old yard debris somewhere in your garden um, if it's not causing damage or getting in the way. Um, some bumblebee queens nest in leaf litter and leaf piles over the winter. So leaving things alone once fall hits and into the winter, once there's um, some frost starting, leaving things alone over the winter, you'll be surprised how many organisms live in this old debris and you can support a lot of organisms that way. Of course, avoid spraying where and, and when bees forage. If there are flowers in bloom, you should really only spray in the evening when our beneficial insects aren't as active. Um, and really, if possible, don't spray at all when flowers are in bloom. If you are a beekeeper or know a beekeeper, keeping your honey beehives healthy is very important. Keeping varroa mite numbers under control is very important. Honeybees can spread diseases and parasites to other colonies when they're sick, and there is concern that they could then spread it to other bee species. So keeping them healthy is very important. And then supporting research is also important. That doesn't have to be money, but like I mentioned at the very beginning, if you learn something new, if you have a fun fact just telling people about this, I think some of this information is really hard to find. And if people don't know, they can't protect what they don't know, they can't make efforts to conserve what they don't know, and they can't care about what they don't know. So just telling people fun things that we learn, making people interested in this sort of stuff is a really great way to continue to support the organisms we want to. All right, so with that, I'll end with resources for you all. So I wrote this, um, The Bees of North Carolina an Identification Guide with Elsa Youngstead, a professor at NC State. If you scan this QR code, you can get to the link, but also if you just searched the title, there's a free PDF available online for everyone through NC State Extension. You can also purchase a hard copy if you are interested. And, um, other resources that I think are really great, The Bees of the World by Charles Michener. I joke it's like the bee textbook. It is kind of a thick read, but if you have a question, it's probably answered in there. If you want to get more into identification, Discover Life is the website I use for all of my research. There's a bit of a learning curve for how to use the website, but it's really great. If you have images, bugguide.net is um, a community forum where people post images and everyone helps each other identify them. And then as far as planting guides go, like I mentioned, there's not a perfect guide out there, but starting with region specific guides is a really pl great place to start. So this is just one example by the Pollinator Partnership, but there's a lot out there that you could look at. So with that, I hopefully saved enough time for questions. This is my email if you would like to contact me. And yeah, I'll take any questions. Great. Uh, we did have two questions pop up in the chat, but um, uh, Kathy and Stacy, if they weren't answered, feel free to chime in. I'll stop sharing as well. All right, so David asked, is there a right or wrong way to make a bee hotel? I'm trying to make one or more for outdoor classroom at an elementary school and don't want to do more damage than good. 
Yes, that's a great question. Um, so Elsa Youngstead, who I mentioned, um, is putting together a guide on how to make bee hotels. I can try to find that link to have Julia share with you all after. Um, for the most part, you need to, you want to face it um, in a, a sunny south facing direction. You need to have an overhang so that it's protected and shielded from any weather. And then the materials you use are also generally important. Some people use paper or plastic, and that's been found to actually increase parasites and diseases. So um, wood and bamboo, I think, is really the best material. And the length, um, Elsa will have a specific length of, uh, of tube you want to use in that document. And then the other really important thing is that it does require a small bit of maintenance. So every couple of years you need to switch out the tubes because there are parasites. There's also parasitic wasps, not just parasitic bees that target the kinds of bees that nest in bee hotels. And because they're in this really great concentration that we made, lots of parasites can build up and diseases can build up too. So every couple of years you need to put in brand new tubes. And in that document also lays out the a really easy way to get that done. So I'll share that document with you, but there are a few easy steps to take to make the bee hotel healthier. So Hannah, um, I am curious as to, uh, I know you put up this organization that does bee surveys. So what are they using? Are they just using photographs? to do surveys. Were you talking about the resources at the very end? Uh, yeah, there was one. Um, I don't remember the slide. That's OK. Um, yeah, um, so those resources I was sharing more for identification purposes. Um, one of them, you need a specimen in front of you and you go through this interactive identification key online that was discover life and then bug guide is where you can upload pictures and it's a public forum where people help identify there's also things like iNaturalist that is a very similar where you upload a picture and people can help you identify it as far as organiz organizations doing surveys um, that's going to be harder to find. It's a lot of work. Uh, it does take a lot of resources, um, but part of what the United States Native Bee Monitoring Network, the RCN that I also shared, is working towards is developing really easy to follow protocols that if people and organizations are interesting and interested in starting bee surveys, they have a template that they can start with and know that it is um, a good way to do bee surveys. So. If you're interested in starting bee surveys, um, I can talk with you further about specifics that I can recommend to you right now. But having a standardized uh, protocol, that's in the works. And hopefully in the next year or two, we can get something out to everyone. Yeah, I was thinking about like if you were to do a park um, to monitor the biodiversity of native bees within a park, how mm -hmm. do you go about doing that? So that's a great suggestion. Thank you so much. This has been awesome. Yeah, great. I'm glad to hear it. See, I could also look at this. <laughs> so in, in the chat, um, Maria mentioned or asked if you were familiar with the, I'm sorry if I mispronounced this, the REIT Sunflower Project, um, that they're doing bee surveys and have great materials. Oh, probably the Great Sunflower Project. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, there's a few organizations that do have um, information they've put out. They've been around for many years. Um, Xerces is another great resource. Uh, I can collect all those links as well. So if you need a starting point now, um, those would be really good places to start for sure. Um, but I do want to let people know there's more coming, hopefully, that can be a little more standardized for everyone. And let's see, I saw something. Oh, that was the survey question, yes. OK, uh, I see a question about the rusty patched bumblebee. Um, so the thought with um, the reason their distribution is declining, part of it is habitat loss. So whatever you can do to add habitat back into the environment, again, planting variety of flowers, as many flowers as you can, and providing a lot of different nesting materials, you'll be able to support a wide variety of, of organisms beyond just bees. So doing the basic thing of adding habitat back can have broad reaching effects. 
But the biggest thing for the rusty patch is probably temperatures rising. And as individuals, there's not really a lot we can do about that. Um, the best thing right now is known populations being protected and really carefully taken care of. So that's what we can do right now as far as um, protecting rusty patch, but adding habitat can help a wide variety of species. Yeah, OK, I think I addressed most of what's in the chat. Cool. Well, again, if anyone has any questions, feel free to throw it in the chat um, or you can unmute yourself if um, you'd like and ask it out loud if that's easier for you. Um, Hannah will be sharing those links to me for all the resources she provided, um, and I will send that out um, um, along with the for those of you that need that EE form. Um, and a link to the recording in case you want to share it with others or rewatch it. Um, we did have another one pop up and asked. Um, so Maria is asking, are there a lot of bees that do leaf cutting? She sees them yeah. a lot in her yard. Oh, that's great. That's great. Yes, um, there are quite a few. I don't know the exact number now, but something I'll share. Um, so Elsa, her name keeps coming up a lot. Elsa and I are working together to document an official bee list for all the species in North Carolina. We do not have an official list for North Carolina right now, but we're working on it. And there is a draft version available on the North Carolina Biodiversity website. I will share that link. Don't worry about trying to remember it now. Um, and so that will list all of the species that uh, are leaf cutters, but there's um, at least a dozen, probably closer to like 20 plus that do the leaf cutting. Um, and depending on what region of the state you're in and what plant you have will depend on what species you see. Um, okay, could you repeat who's developing the standard protocol other than what's in the Handy Bee Manual? Yes, the Handy Bee Manual is another really great resource. You all are, I'll, I'll provide all those links. You all already know a lot of them. That's really great. Um, I was talking about, we mentioned the great sunflower project in Xerces, which is spelled with an X at the beginning, S-X-E-R-C-E-S. And then the US Native Bee Monitoring Network are the three that I think we mentioned. Um, and then, uh, glad you mentioned that honeybees are non native. I hear that they get a lot of press and love because of good lobbyists. Your thoughts on this? Yes, so honeybees are a tricky one. Um, like I mentioned, our agricultural system is really reliant on honeybees. We are planting huge monocultures of single crops. And there's not a lot of bees that are good at pollinating that. That's really what the honeybee does. Honeybees have something called floral constancy where the entire colony can focus on a single crop and they'll just go back and forth to the same kind of crop. They can really efficiently pollinate huge areas of the same kind of crop. And our, most of our native bees do not collect resources that way. So the fact that our agricultural system is set up that way, we uh, we need the honeybee. We would have to change everything in order to move away from relying on honeybees. So honeybees are extremely important for our agricultural system. They're facing a lot of um, similar threats to our native bees. Honeybees get really sick and we have those varroa mites. So they do, I think it's fair that they get a lot of attention, but also um, it has been a really, I would say, drawn out process to get people to understand how different bees are from each other and why bees are important and why they care about them. All of us now are like, of course bees are important. But I would say a decade ago, not everyone thought that way. So honeybees have kind of been the poster child for pollinators. They got a lot of funding towards protecting pollinators. They got a lot of interest in pollinators. And now we can start talking to people now that they understand that bees are important. They understand what a bee is. We can start getting into this nitty gritty like we did today. If people didn't even care about bees and I gave this presentation, it would they wouldn't care. They would not think about anything I said. We got into so many details. So I think it's just the evolution of how research is going and how um, protecting the environment is going. It's always going to change. There's always going to be a new focus. So I do think it's important for people to remember that honeybees are not native. And so when we're talking about conserving bees, that's not the species that homeowners should focus on. Um, honeybees are really more livestock. They're in agricultural systems. They're not in our natural areas as much. 
Um, if you want to be a beekeeper, that is wonderful, but conserving bees is not the same as working with honeybees. So I do think it's important for people to know, but also we can't live and can't eat without our honeybees right now. Well, we got eight o'clock now, unless anyone has any um, pressing questions they want to throw out um, before we end up. Um, I want to say thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Um, we will be uh, hosting another lecture next month. Um, I believe it's the 12th of October. Um, oh, 10th of October. For those of you that have already registered for that, the original speaker is no longer available. I am working to uh, line up a new speaker. And as soon as I have that um, lined up, I will let everybody know. Thank you for joining us again tonight. Um, be on the lookout for an email from me with that EE form as well as a link to the recording. Thanks everyone.